First of all, thank you to everyone for attending and thanks to Sarah for inviting me. Um, uh, it's, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to use this rather shamelessly as an opportunity to promote our new book, which has just gone to the publisher this week. Um, it's a book about making curriculum, but it's, it's something I think which is extremely relevant to Curriculum for Excellence. Um, I think it's particularly relevant at the moment, given that Curriculum for Excellence has had something of a refresh this year, the refresh narrative which has introduced more of a process approach based around big curriculum questions around why, what and how. Um, and I think that then it's, it's essential we do consider this question, which I'll put on the title page, what does it mean to make a curriculum? So I want to start really by emphasising here um, with using some recent and some not so recent literature, um, the need, well, why we need to have curriculum thinking. Um, I mean, Zongyi Deng, um, who's just published a, an excellent book um, around content, knowledge, curriculum and didactic, which um, seeks to draw lessons from um, the German tradition of didactic and Bildung and also North American curriculum thinking, particularly the work of Joseph Fab, uh, is uh, he's just published that book. And uh, I think he provides a very lucid account of why we need curriculum thinking. And in particular, the uh, sort of current global movement, as you put it here, towards academic standards, outcomes and account accountability, which renders the curriculum invisible. It, it literally disappears in educational policy and discourse. Um, and I think that, that Zong, Zong Yideng has got it spot on here. Um, CFE overtly gives teachers permission to innovate, to make the curriculum, but at the same time, it's surrounded by all of these um, uh, current global movement discourses around standards, outcomes and accountability, which actually simultaneously render curriculum making quite difficult. And I think it's, it's absolutely essential then that we have a, uh, an overview of curriculum and an understanding of what it means to make the curriculum. Um, and part of that is this notion that actually teachers, whether uh, working in very prescriptive systems or whether working in very permissive systems, again, quoting Deng here, are fundamentally curriculum makers. Um, but the outcomes and academic standards movement tends to construe them rather as deliverers or implementers. And I want to make a sharp distinction here. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally it's not desirable, nor is it actually possible to see something that's been faithfully implemented or delivered. I think that we always make judgments, we always interpret, we always translate. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. And going back to the wise words of Walter Doyle writing in the 1990s, um, in, in respect of actually the American uh, systems, um, he argued that to teach effectively, teachers must be responsible curriculum theorists. In other words, to have a good understanding of what curriculum is and how it works. And that curriculum making is a deliberative process of interpretation, judgment and responsibility. And that really sums it up very nicely in a couple of sentences. Um, now, of course, what we require then, if we're going to realize that, are a range of things and I've listed some of them here. Um, nuanced understanding of what curriculum is as a concept. Um, we have, I think in recent years, tended to see curriculum as either statements of content or in the case of CFE, and this is a wider global movement, as pretty much everything that happens in schools. Um, so we have simultaneously a very narrow view and a very broad view, but what it doesn't do is help us understand what curriculum is and I want to try and unpack that. Um, also, nuanced practices of exactly what practices are associated with the curriculum. And that, for me, is really about curriculum making. Um, it means that we need to have skilled practitioners. And to paraphrase um, Lawrence Stenhouse, again, writing in the 70s, there can be no curriculum development without teacher development. We need constructive rather than constrictive policy. Uh, and interestingly, I use the word constrictive because my spell checker wrote it when I wrote constructive. And I thought that actually it was rather a nice contrast here. Um, you know, does policy help us make curriculum in schools or does it actually hinder, constrict what we're doing? Um, something that came out of the book very strongly, looking at nine European case studies, is the need for what we're calling a meso level, um, which includes supportive infrastructure for curriculum making and of course good resources. So I want to sort of touch on each of these as we go through. Um, the book itself is going to be published in, in January. Um, I'm drawing primarily on the introductory chapter here, uh, titled Curriculum Making a Conceptual Framing. And in that chapter, we're, we're trying to do something a little bit new. We're working with existing theories around curriculum making, but we're trying to reframe them and reconceptualize them. Um, 
the book itself, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say, has some excellent authors in it. Um, we've got a, a fantastic chapter by Bob Lingard, which looks at global curriculum flows and the global actors and organizations and discourses that frame curriculum in national jurisdictions. We've got um, a range of very different case studies from Southern Europe, Northern Europe, um, Western Europe, and indeed one from a uh, post-socialist um, regime um, curriculum um, system in the Czech Republic. And there are a lot of commonalities between these countries, but also a lot of differences. But one thing that's come through very, very clearly here is that the meso level, in other words, the bit that sits between policy and school, is actually pretty crucial if we're going to make curriculum uh, constructively in schools. And in some of these case studies, it's relatively absent, for example, in England. Um, and in others, it's very strong, for example, in Finland and to some extent in Cyprus and the Netherlands. So um, th this is, I think, a major conclusion here. Um, these case studies uh, represent different approaches, of course, to curriculum. So we've got a range of, of, of cases here which are largely oriented towards um, the sort of CFE type curriculum based around outcomes and competencies. But we've also got a couple of outliers, countries which have gone against that trend, uh, and they're England and Sweden, where there's been a, a turn back towards traditional uh, knowledge content type curricula. Okay, so I want to just introduce a few concepts here. And the first one, um, I think, is this idea of curriculum as social practice. Um, and I'm offering a definition here, which is quite different than some of the definitions I just uh, briefly described. Um, and I'd like to see curriculum defined uh, explicitly as social practices. And that would include not just the content that we teach, but the infrastructure we set up to support the curriculum, the way in which we teach it, teach it the pedagogy, and also the evaluation. So this is the social practices through which education is structured, enacted and evaluated. And that requires us really to consider at least three dimensions here. Um, the first one is this idea of social practice. That this is the curriculum is something that is made by practitioners and other actors working with each other in different social settings. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second one is the idea that it happens across multiple layers, or uh, as we're framing in the chapter, sites of activity in education systems. Um, so, for example, curriculum is made by policymakers uh, in statements of intent and national frameworks. It's made by national agencies who produce support materials. Importantly, it's also made in schools, of course, uh, and classrooms. Um, and the third dimension I want to consider briefly here is the sorts of practices which comprise curriculum. Uh, and there's a whole range of things that we need to take into account. Um, and I think one of the problems with the, uh, the very broad conception in CFE, the curriculum is everything that's planned in schools, apart from the fact that there's a lot of unplanned curriculum, hidden curriculum, is that it doesn't really break down what those practices are. So we've made some attempts here to actually try and define what it is that constitute curricular practices. Okay, I just want to sort of also draw your attention to some work that's been done around the different approaches to uh, curriculum. Um, so Deng and Luke, for example, have identified what they call four broad concept uh, orientations of curriculum. And Shiro does something similar with his work on curriculum ideologies. So some curricula are basically following an academic rationalism approach. So we're talking here about traditional liberal forms of knowledge content led curriculum, where the knowledge content is often the end rather than the means. And then um, something that resonates much more with CFE, the social efficiency model, this idea that the curriculum is about preparing future citizens and learners, um, and also um, people for the work, uh, skills for the workplace. And they've been characterized by people like Michael Young as a technical rational approach, often framed around um, very complex frameworks of outcomes and, and competencies. Um, two more that are worth noting here, the humanist approaches, which would include uh, the progressive education of the likes of John Dewey, often child-centered approaches, and then um, curricula which are, are perhaps more familiar in adult education, social reconstructionism, uh, curricula which is set up explicitly to change society, to challenge inequality, to framed around principles of social justice and so on. And I think it's important to note that these are ideal types. Um, you know, CFE actually has elements, I think, of all four of those. But for me, it really falls into the second category. 
Um, these curricular approaches do involve different purposes, different practices. And um, I think it's important to note as well that two to four are often, because they share similar terminology and similar methods, are often conflated. And this has led to often very crude characterizations we've seen in some of the debates in south of the border about traditional versus progressive curricula and CFE being characterized as progressive. I've even seen um, Ofsted characterized as progressive educators, which is quite interesting, I think. So curriculum orientation is worth bearing in mind. Um, I think another um, issue here is to, um, to think about curriculum as being systemic. And this uh, quotation from Michael Connolly here, I think is, is quite apt. A complex system involving teachers, students, curricular content, social settings, and all manner of impinging matters ranging from the local to the international and for Connolly the key question is how it all works together uh, and this I think is a major insight we cannot introduce curriculum uh, in policy without looking at how it's going to work in schools we cannot look at curriculum in schools without thinking about how we support schools and how the curriculum is, is received in schools and by, by students for example um, and we've talked along similar lines in our editorial in the curriculum journal in the special edition in 2018 where we talked about curriculum has been a complex web of enactment. Um, this um, quotation from the chapter I think again sums up quite neatly the complexity that's involved in um, uh, developing a curriculum. You know it involves highly dynamic processes of interpretation, mediation, negotiation and translation across multiple layers or sites of education systems. So that would include um, government texts, that is government prescription, and um, as we note here, they're already products of interpretation. Um, when committees or bodies develop and try to operationalize them into forms usable in schools, so for example, um, taking broad ideas and changing them into programs and, and frameworks. And then of course that there is subs subsequent recontextualization uh, as school leaders and teachers um, interpret them and reinterpret them and as they're reinterpreted to make them work in classrooms. So this is um, a complex process and really makes a mockery of the idea that we can have a, a teacher-proof curriculum, something that is, is going to be implemented very faithfully. So curriculum making here, uh, and this is a term that has a long history, it goes back at least as far as Franklin Bobbitt writing in 1918, um, is something that happens across multiple sites, as we've quoted here, um, in interaction, intersection with one another, often very unpredictable, often very messy, often very context specific, and it produces these unique social practices. So a curriculum in one school is always going to be different to a curriculum in another. Um, and some of the activities which are involved in curriculum making I've listed here. So production of policy texts, program development, lesson planning, and of course, pedagogical interactions, what um, Doyle calls curriculum events, classroom transactions. And of course, this involves many different actors, often working with very different aims. There's often tension between the intended and the um, enacted curriculum. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to what, what can be seen as some false gods, some unattainable ideals here, which have, I think, benighted policy for many years. Um, the idea of fidelity from policy to practice is one of them. Um, CFE is, is replete with talk of delivery and implementation, and the notion that somehow the curriculum is a product which you can take and uncritically place in a classroom. Um, associated with that, ideas about teachers as technocrats or technicians, what Ball uh, said, the attempt to turn teachers into unselfconscious classroom drones. And um, a point I've made elsewhere is why bother educating teachers to a degree level and beyond if we're just going to make them do mechanical tasks. And the notion of teacher-proof curriculum has been uh, a constant in particularly the Anglo-American tradition for many years. Um, we see it also in ideas around best practice that we can take somebody else's idea of best practice and just implement it uncritically. Um, and of course, all of these are linked in the, the sort of global economic reform movement, or GERM, as Pazzi Selberg called it, uh, to notions of accountability through central specification. And we see the, the results of that, often very instrumental tick box teaching, spirals of specification as the documents become more and more complex, bureaucracy and additional workload. And I would 
certainly echo Deng here, who says that such approaches are based on an academic, uh, sorry, an economic rationality, managerial control, and not on educational thinking. Okay, so I want to, to sort of start to think about how we can theorize curriculum making across these levels here. Um, now, traditionally, and there's thinking going back at least 50 years on this, um, starting probably with Goodlad's work in the 70s, which um, sought to theorize curriculum making across three distinct levels here. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the societal, the top level, is, is about um, the sort of abstract discourses, the interface between schooling and wider societal discourses. This is where educational ideas are generated, um, but often in a very abstract form. And then what um, I think uh, Goodlad called the institutional, what uh, Deng calls the programmatic, which is the policy text production. This is where we produce frameworks and programs of work. And then um, uh, scholars have talked about the instructional or the classroom level, where this is the local curriculum making. Now, we in the chapter of the book, we started by thinking about curriculum making from two points. This is one of them. Um, and we decided that this really was insufficiently granular for the complexities of modern systems. Um, it didn't, for example, uh, consider adequately, I think, the, the, the emergence of international actors like the OECD. It didn't consider adequately the, uh, the notion of the MISO level support, um, for example, the RICs in Scotland or the shared sense making that we saw in Finland. Um, so we needed something a little bit more complex. And also these um, models have been uh, criticized and their, their proponents like Goodlad and Doyle have acknowledged this has been hierarchical and linear. This is a, a center periphery way of implementing the curriculum. And for us, another problem is that the focus tends to be not on the activity, the type of activity, but more on the institutional levels. So the government, the national level is, 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 is at the top. Schools are at the bottom. And what it doesn't account for is actors moving between levels. So, for example, um, in Wales, we've seen school teachers, for example, working not only in classrooms, but also writing national policy and supporting the development of national policy in the regional consortia. So we, we moved to a, a different um, framework here, which was something posited by um, mainly Jan van den Acker. Uh, coming out of the work of the SLO in the, in the Netherlands. And this is a much more granular approach. It also has the benefit of separating out the transnational and the national, and also the different layers in school. But for us, this was also problematic because it's, it's absolutely rarefied um, this set of levels as something which are distinct levels rather than intersecting sites of activity. It can be seen as linear and hierarchical. It focuses on products produced within the levels. So, for example, um, you know, uh, the examination programs at a national level, teaching plans at the micro level and so on. Um, and it doesn't really account for the actors, again, moving between these levels. So we felt there was a, a need for a, a more sophisticated model here. So we've, we've come up with this um, approach, which utilizes the, um, the granularity of the Van den Acker approach. But instead of talking about institutional levels, we've made a, a distinct shift to thinking about it in terms of sites of activity. So curriculum making is defined at different, in different sites, not by who does it, but by the type of activity that's happening. Um, and this is um, the notion that curriculum making here is social practice that happens in different forms for different reasons uh, and in different sites. And this allows us to be very flexible about uh, actors moving from one level to another level. Um, now, this could be criticized again for being hierarchical. Um, we've got the supra sitting at the top and the nano. So in the conclusion chapter of the book, we tried to represent it a little differently. Um, and this uh, sort of intersecting wheels that rotate um, can show movement between sites and actors moving into different forms of activities. Um, and this. Um, I think for us helps us understand the complexity here and the interconnection between these different sites of activity and certainly offers a, a less linear view of curriculum making across the system. Okay, so I want to move now on to thinking about implications and particularly in respect of um, curriculum for excellence and where we currently sit in Scotland.
Um, so, for example, if we start with the macro level, um, which can be seen in Scotland in terms of producing national policy for curriculum, um, and I, I think the, um, uh, the, the, the refreshed narrative at least partially falls into this arena here. Um, what I would like to see is um, policy which uh, has um, a clear idea of what it's doing, I think. Um, this means a firmer articulation, a better conceptualization of, of educational purposes and principles than we currently have. One of the problems, I think, with Scottish policy in recent years has been the, the tendency not to conceptualize uh, what are, are key concepts and leave them open to interpretation so they can mean anything to anyone. Um, I think we also need to have a much better systemic overview. And this especially involves the avoidance of tensions between policies. Where, for example, do policies around um, assessment and evaluation of the system interfere with policies around curriculum making? Um, I think this is start the third one is starting to happen here, which is the facilitation of MISO support structures. I think that there has been significant work since the OECD review, particularly with the um, development of the RICs. But a, a key role for, for government is actually making sure that the structures sit in place to develop the curriculum and, of course, resourcing those properly. Now, if we think about the existing system of MISO level support in Scotland, um, in terms of, for example, through Education Scotland, local authorities and, and the RICs, um, that we can learn from some of the um, the things that are happening in, in other countries, uh, which come out in our case study chapters. And one of the things that really stood out for us was the importance of shared sense making. Uh, in the Finnish case, um, there are really well developed mechanisms, processes for engaging district and local people with ideas about the curriculum, and in particular, ensuring that people understand the difference between the old and the new. Um, we also saw the role in some countries um, of the expert teacher, for example, in Sweden and the subject counsellors in Cyprus, people whose role sits between school and the government, but whose role is specifically about providing expertise and support for schools. And that they also extend to some of the structures we've seen in some countries, for example, the junior cycle teams in Ireland and hopefully the RICs in Scotland, although a word of caution about the RICs is that there needs to be perhaps more clarity of function. At the moment, I'm seeing a lot of energy going into uh, performance management and developing performance data. And this, I think, can get in the way of some of the development functions that the RICs should arguably have. Uh, and certainly, um, I have been asked uh, personally whether the programmes we run into the RIC will show evidence in six months of improvements in literacy, which I don't see it as, as happening in the short term. Uh, but certainly what we're trying to do is to build capacity there. So one of the things that comes out of the book and comes from all of the case studies is the crucial importance of the meso layer, however it might be constituted, and it's constituted differently in different countries, as a crucial factor behind successful curriculum making uh, in schools. Um, in terms of the micro, um, I mean, some of these things have been well documented in the literature. Um, I would su suggest that, you know, the need for resources and often resources would include cognitive resources. Um, you know, I, I do think back to the, the days of the schools projects uh, in schools council projects in England in the 70s, which produce courses like schools history project. And those are fabulous resources for teachers to use and adapt in school. And we're, we're really lacking that sort of stuff in Scotland at the moment. Um, the space and time to make the curriculum with colleagues, teacher learning communities are important here, but allied to that, I think that we need to have systematic processes like professional inquiry, our own version here, critical collaborative professional inquiry, uh, has, has been shown empirically to have a, a strong effect on, on the capacity of teachers to develop the curriculum. And I think another word of warning here, and this I think is particularly salient in the, in the case of Scotland because the curriculum does not specify content in many subject areas, is that we need to see knowledge as a means rather than an end. Um, my colleague Joe Smith writing about history has found significant evidence, um, for example, of instrumental selection of content without asking questions about the significance of content for the wider historical education of people. So content is often chosen because we have the textbooks or because it's on the test next year or simply because it's a sexy topic that the, that the, uh, the students like. 
Um, in terms of the nano, um, I think that uh, we've seen significant progress in recent years uh, towards uh, a sort of more sophisticated notion of pedagogy in many classrooms. And I think um, Doyle's conception here of curriculum events is really helpful. You know, it is not possible to faithfully implement curriculum intentions in the classrooms. What it is possible to do, though, is to engage in what, what um, Doyle calls joint negotiations. Uh, in classroom settings where students, teachers and materials um, are engaged in transactions which lead to particular planned learning outcomes happening. And this is a messy and contingent process, it's a social practice, it's not neat box ticking, uh, it does speak strongly about the need to think how we frame the curriculum as well, and it does really engage us in the idea that curriculum is something that has to be, fit, uh, pedagogy is something that has to be fit for purpose. And we need to consider whether what we're doing, whether it be direct instruction or whether it be uh, more cooperative group inquiry based methods, whether they're actually doing what we want them to do. So I've been talking for long enough now. I'm going to put some questions up and then I'm very happy to open up the discussion for half an hour or so. I've got to turn the light on as well. Thank you, Mark. I've got a question to start us off, actually, which I think is a really good one um, and links into actually discussions that we've been having actually within um, CIRA around the difference between curriculum and education and then ideas of schooling. Um, and I think that's come to the fore significantly through, well, the whole COVID pandemic of how we perceive the idea of schooling and um, then education and curriculum within that. So Paul Adams was asking about how is curriculum different to education or does it need to be? Um, I don't see curriculum as different to education. I see curriculum as fundamental to asking educational questions. Um, Deng talks about uh, asking um, the big curriculum questions are fundamental to constructing any educational system. Otherwise, we end up with a system that um, can become very instrumental uh, and actually not educational often. So questions like why, the purpose questions are really fundamental to educational practice and their curriculum questions. Um, the what questions, um, one of the issues with modern curricula, particularly the competency-based curriculum, um, is, is that it doesn't ask knowledge questions. In fact, arguably the content-led approaches in England don't ask knowledge questions either. Uh, Michael Young and Joe Muller wrote a very interesting article about 10 years ago where they identified three curriculum scenarios. Uh, scenario one was the uh, naive uh, content-led approach, which has characterised much British education in the last 100 years. Scenario two is the competency-based approach, which arguably doesn't ask knowledge questions and strips knowledge out of the equation. It's all about skills and competencies. And then their, their version, scenario three, is about um, uh, the idea that we we ask the uh, that that we we base our education in the disciplines and how we basically engage with knowledge and and I think that that's um, also possibly not a, an adequate maybe we need a scenario four here, which is that content knowledge is important, but we need to differentiate very clearly between the knowledge that's enshrined in disciplines and the content that we select, and that means asking proper questions about why we put certain types of content in the curriculum, um, how we make these selections, that's really important, um, and, and what, what, what is powerful about that knowledge? It's not just powerful because it sits in some discipline and has been constructed by um, an academic or a set of academics working over the years. It's also powerful for what it enables people to do. Uh, it enables people to engage in society's conversation. It enables people to uh, engage in the workforce. It enables people to become uh, citizens. So um, Deng's idea that we see curricula, uh, we see knowledge as a, a, a means, not an end for me, is a very powerful one. Now, all of those are curriculum questions, and I don't see how you can have an education system without at least going some way towards asking those questions. We could also include the how questions, the pedagogy questions as well. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that links in with, there was points coming in there about the, uh, the conception, the, the idea of knowledge and curriculum and the debate and discussion, the, the significant de debate and discussion around that. And I think you started to touch on that as well. Mm. Um, 
and it links in again with uh, people talking about expectations of curriculum and particularly coming societal parental expectations and that close link to assessment high stakes assessment like examinations um so i suppose that links into you know what you've picked up there about what next for scotland and thinking about the curriculum in scotland what is your thinking around that about how we're now conceptualizing and seeing ideas of knowledge and assessment linked within that um well okay so uh, a lot of complexity in there I mean, Scotland has, a, I think, an issue in secondary schools and probably to some extent in primary schools as well, because assessment uh, uh, exerts a, an overpowerful effect on, on the curriculum thinking. And an antidote to that is, is, is asking these curriculum questions, the, the why questions and the what questions. Um, I know that my daughter, for example, um, did Stalin's Russia for three years on the trot. And when I asked the teacher about it, the history teacher, I was told that it was because they didn't have to reteach the basic content for the next level. And that's, I think, a very powerful example, and probably quite an extreme one in some ways, of how um, decisions about education are made without due regard to questions about the curriculum. And, and the, the why questions, the what questions, and the how questions are really, really fundamental here. If we ask those questions, we start to challenge some of the taken for granted um, axioms about what should go in the curriculum for example we start to look at the content that we select and look at it anew we start to look at the methodologies that we employ in classrooms to teach and start to to think about how we can avoid just teaching to the test and that's not to downgrade the importance of qualifications but it is to say that we need to be aware as practitioners of the dangers of qualifications leading the process and actually coming to dominate the process and in the process losing sight of the fact that you need to educate people there was an interesting conversation on twitter a couple of weeks ago about the difference between higher english and the vocational version of it that's found in many fe colleges and the practitioner who was talking who teaches both was saying that the people who do higher english come out with with low levels of literacy um, and and worse uh, understanding of grammar for example than the people who have been through the the vocational version because the unfortunately the higher is geared towards the exam and often that's a very formulaic approach and i, I see something yeah, similar happening in my own subject history you can teach um many qualifications by adopting a formulaic approach which arguably doesn't educate yeah and i think that's coming out in some of the chat that you know um just coming from Mary Lappin saying the discord between claims of a progressive innovative CFE and yet deeply conservative and national ex examinations um, mm. and exactly what you're saying there that that leads everything. Um, yeah so so we can we can point to the progressive attributes of CFE and the policy um, and I would argue that it's not entirely progressive anyway it has progressive elements. Um, we can also point to the, um, the competency frameworks which frame um, education in a particular way and are very influential in leading to certain sorts of practice we can talk about the lack of uh, attention to knowledge questions um, all of these things are, are really i think significant here but we also have to bear in mind that that's only one part of the jigsaw the intended curriculum is not what is experienced by young people in classrooms so we need to think very carefully about and this is i think where finland do a better job in some respects how do we engage practitioners with the intended document in a critical and informed way and enable them to develop practices which you know to some extent go with the national processes but at the same time reflect local needs as well um, and and often what we we tend to see is that people will interpret the curriculum through the lenses that they have already we saw that very clearly in our teacher agency yeah. research uh, we saw not evidence that people had changed their practice as a result of CFE. We saw plenty of evidence um, of uh, teachers who had relabeled their practice with CFE labels. Um, and that for me speaks volumes about the needs for um, good teacher education because teachers need to develop a critical vocabulary with which to interrogate policy um, through the lens of educational ideas. Yeah, definitely. I think as well, there's an interesting question coming about the point you're raising there around 
the local aspect of the curriculum and thinking about bringing it back to the, the pupils is central to that. Um, and there's a question coming in about to what extent should the needs or desires of particular groups of pupils or the pupils in a class lead curricular content and to what extent should the needs and desires of students influence curriculum on other levels? Yeah, hang on, I'm, I'm being interfered with by the rain here, I'm going to shut the window. Okay. <laughs> We've just had a downpour outside, I can't hear properly. Um, I mean, it's, it's, as ever, it's a balance. Um, yeah, a curriculum which is entirely local in, in its orientations would be selling people short because it's, it's not engaging people with the big questions of the world. Um, also, I think a curriculum which is entirely abstract and based around uh, abstract forms of knowledge which don't have relevance for young people's lives is also selling them short. There has to be, I think, some, some um, capacity for local variation but we don't want to see the sort of unacceptable levels of variation that can can easily transpire if the frameworks are vague, if people don't understand them properly, or if schools have too much autonomy. One of one of the um, one of the insights that we've got through our teacher agency work is the is the idea that autonomy is not the same as agency. You can give schools lots of autonomy, but in doing so, you may actually deprive them of the means to develop the curriculum properly and undermine their agency as, as practitioners, because policy should be providing conceptual frameworks, it should be providing ideas and resources, it should be supporting practice. Yeah, and I think linking to that actually, and interestingly, there's a question come in about is it an example of a curriculum that's potentially um, failed a country or society? And I think actually it, this links back to, um, and it was, I think it was Graham Donaldson I heard saying actually curriculum for excellence is on the cusp of, uh, the, of what's happening just now in terms of where it's going to go next and how it's going to develop. So I suppose that's two questions together, if you like, a bit linked, but um, what did you find anything in the book, any examples um, elsewhere or otherwise about, sort of curriculum not working or failing countries or societies? It's, it's possibly, um, I mean, Scotland's probably one of the countries which is, as Graham Donaldson said, on the cusp, but the other one is the Czech Republic. Um, these are both early adopters of competency-based curricula. Um, in both cases, we're seeing um, uh, an implementation or an enactment process which has been problematic, to say the least. Uh, and in both cases, I think there's high potential. In fact, it's already started in the Czech Republic for blame games to happen. Uh, the title of the Czech chapter is, is, includes the word blame games. Um, I, I think that we're in serious danger of um, some people saying, well, CFE was a great idea on paper, but it didn't work properly because teachers didn't do it properly, or it didn't work properly because Education Scotland implemented it badly, or it didn't work properly because local authorities got it wrong or it didn't work properly because it was a bad policy from the government. And, and those sorts of conversations, I don't think are constructive. And what we do need to get into, I think, in Scotland is the idea that in successful systems, uh, there is a, an ongoing cycle of renewal and that uh, people learn from the mistakes which we inevitably make because it's, it's not a precise science, it's an inexact art uh, of, of, of developing a national curriculum. How do we learn from that? Finland's a good example where they've, they've been through uh, repeated cycles of curriculum renewal. They see it as renewal. Um, they don't see it as a climb down, uh, which I'm afraid to say is the case in Scotland. Uh, you know, it would not be possible to have a proper review. If you look at the fuss that's been made about the OECD review, which let's face it, is going to be a surface level review of the curriculum. Um, the idea that you, you have a, a, a root and branches review of the curriculum is really difficult politically to swallow. It will be held up as evidence of SMP failure. I'm always intrigued by the way that the curriculum is framed as the SMP's um, curriculum for excellence, when in fact it was Labour that brought it in in the first place as well. So I think we've, the, the, the political issues get in the way. The blame games are a problem. But we, we could and we should, I think, be looking at how we learn from CFE, how we take the good elements of it and how we build upon it. And for me, the policy had its flaws, but actually the issue, I think, lies in the ways in which we've subsequently tried to develop the curriculum. And, and it's been developed, I think, through a, what, what's effectively an evaluation methodology rather than the curriculum making methodology. And for me, that's the big problem. So do you think that you highlight the political issues around it and is that what you find in a number of the other countries is there 
a great deal of political influence within the curriculum? Um, it depends what you mean by political influence. Um, I mean, yeah, politicians are a one side of the equation. Um, if you look at the Irish case, for example, um, the, the real problem in Ireland has been the hostility of one of the big teacher unions who withdrew from the process. And, and I think they've achieved what they've achieved in Ireland despite that. Um, they've, had, they've developed very, very well articulated systems and processes for enabling schools to engage with the new curriculum, uh, particularly around groups of teachers who sit outside of schools and um, have supported schools in developing new thinking. Um, it's still a long way to go in Ireland as well, but that's happened despite the opposition of a, a very powerful political group, one of the teaching unions. If you could imagine if the EIS had, had instructed its members in Scotland to say, don't engage with curriculum for excellence, just do what you've always done. That's exactly what's happened in Ireland. Um, in, in other countries, um, you know, Portugal is a good example, I think, of a country where there's been quite a top-down approach and, and quite a lot of uh, government um, direction of the process. So there's this rhetoric of school autonomy at the same time uh, as we've got a, um, a sort of uh, directive process coming from the top. Um, and I think Scotland sort of sits somewhere in between that. So we, we've got relatively light um, input regulation. The curriculum is not highly specified in terms of what people teach or indeed even how they teach, but it is highly specified in terms of outputs, the output regulation. So if we're measuring people by certain uh, quite na often quite narrow measures and we have a range of, of different tools, um, you know, examination data, insights and so on, and, and also use of inspections and local authority audits, then inevitably people are going to see those as important and see some of the other aspects of the curriculum as less important. So um, how do we get around that? For me, it has to be done through a process of mutual adaptation and, a, and a, a, an idea which has been talked around a lot in, in, in Wales of, of subsidiarity. You know, there are clear demarcations, I think, in Wales, or they're trying to do this, between um, the government's function, which is to produce conceptual frameworks and um, a very well developed system in the middle, the MISO system of pioneer schools and the regional consortia, whose job is very much about support. And then um, the schools where the, the, the idea is enactment and, and people are, are doing specific things and going through specific processes. So I think that this, this is not a top down or a bottom up model, but it's a sort of um, in, uh, top down, bottom up and from the sides is what the Netherlands talked about. Now, they've not got it right either. They've, they've given the teachers too much autonomy and removed some of the expertise organisations like the SLO had from the process, and they've ended up going around in circles. So uh, there is no ideal system, uh, but what we can do is learn from the, the country cases and say, well, what would work in the specific context of Scotland? What do we have to change in Scotland? Uh, and that's not just structural change. It's, unfortunately, it's cultural change as well, which is not a, an overnight process, it's a generational process really. How do we move towards something in the long term that's going to lead to better educational experiences and outcomes for young people? Yeah, and I think, I mean, just I think building on what you've said there and it's the, I'm just looking at the chat and it's coming back to again, you know, questioning this um, curriculum for excellence is there, is there for three to 18. But the, the, the questions are coming back again about the problem is, is that it's still examination and assessment led and that the real stuff comes in after, um, you know, after broad general education, that that's where, where it, that comes in and that's problematic. Mm. Um, is that your view? Is there, do you think there's, is there movements to change that or do you think that's still dominant? Um, I think it's dominant. I think it's been unhelpful. Um, I think there are changes happening. I'm talking to a lot of head teachers and, um, and practitioners now who are telling me really encouraging things about the BGE. Um, and I'm talking here about secondary schools primarily. Um, but um, so, so I think that the, 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 one of the big failings of CFE, and I'm going to use that word here, is that we focused in secondary schools on the examinations phase, which arguably didn't need that much change anyway. And we've neglected the foundational phase, which is basically the broad general education. And we've done so in a way that's, that's failed to um, address, for example, the sharp 
dichotomy from primary to secondary where you get a distinct change in culture. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, that, and this is a good example of where we need to think systemically. It's not enough just to change the specification. We need to change these. We need to change the structures and the supports to enable this to happen. We need to change the culture. We need to change, for example, the way that people see years S1 to S3. So it's not seen as a dress rehearsal for exams in a, a narrow range of subjects, but it's seen very much more about how we engage young people with particular forms of knowledge which are vital for living in a modern complex democracy okay we need to think about whether we have the right teachers to do that you know um i can't understand in some ways why we've not moved to a, a category of a, a sort of broad general education teacher who can teach across from say years eight um you know eight year old to 14 year old many countries do uh, we have a colleague at sterling who's come from another country where she's she's a, a math teacher but primary trained her job would be to teach across those that primary secondary gap but we have in in the uk a system which is based on five to eleven and eleven to seventeen or eighteen what we don't have is for example middle schools which used to do this in many parts of the uk nor do we have um, a primary school that goes for example as many countries have from seven to thirteen years old so the structures in place actually are inhibiting curriculum for excellence the types of teachers we have available i would certainly like to see um, bg teaching in secondary school being done to some extent by people who are more generically educated you know social studies teachers languages teachers science teachers general science and so on and defragmenting that whole sort of s1 s2 sort of phase so we're not putting people straight into 16 subjects on the understanding that they're going to choose about half of them to do a qualification in in five years Th this for me is a really big issue yeah so it's it's really about the structures and the back to the ideas about schooling and what we perceive schooling to be mm. um and how we adapt with those those structures and i think the key point you made about perceiving curriculum um and curriculum development as something that is an end point but actually it's a process and it's an ongoing process but it's not seen in that way um yeah yeah and it, it does take us right back to that question that i posed at the start which is the the, the curricular issues the curriculum questions why what and how you know if we don't ask those questions we continue with existing forms of practice even when they're manifestly not fit for purpose yeah and i think the point you're making there about broad general uh, bg registration category uh, well teaching uh, teachers I, I, it's being picked up on the chat and i know as well from the from a perspective from glasgow and edinburgh there are teachers there that mm -hmm. have um, that are uh, ready to teach but the as you say the, the systems aren't there to support it that the registration mm. ca category has not yet been granted yeah and um, again this is this calls for the need for a more systemic look at the curriculum it's not sufficient just to change the specification and hope everyone falls into line with it we need to think about how we embed how we support how we change things that that will hinder it how we enhance things that will facilitate it uh, one of the big success stories i think of scottish education in recent years has been a number of teachers engaging in master's level study and, and that's certainly a feature of countries like cyprus and finland where the majority of teachers have master's degrees in education yeah definitely mm. i'm just looking at the chats if there's i think part of this as well i think you made the point earlier around about time and space that um in curriculum development for teachers and when you were talking about that are we are you seeing do you think we're going to see more of that within the scottish context or it it doesn't feel like it but are there any examples of where we're seeing more time and space being given to teachers um not necessarily no i mean we're under a lot of pressure aren't we and uh, you know s schools are short staffed i think one one bright ray of hope and i think it's very early at the moment is is the roles of the regional improvement collaboratives because what they're doing is is actively creating the spaces where teachers from different schools can come together uh, to discuss educational ideas but i think there needs to be a far clearer idea of what they're for and i don't see their role at all as been developing uh, or producing performance data i think their role has to be seen as a support level and i had an interesting discussion with john swinney about this uh, right at the outset and i've had a recent discussion with him as well on the same subject 
And uh, he seems to agree with me that the role of the RIC is to support the development of practice in schools. Um, and yet I'm seeing practices in the RICs which are really the antithesis of that in many ways. Yeah, um, I think which that... are about evidence and performance and so on. Yeah, I think there's such an emphasis on performance measurement. And that's certainly my experience as well that, that I find as well, which places mm. pressure on, on teachers to meet requirements. And um, yeah, that's, it's very difficult. Yeah, um, I think that the RICs are also subject, and this is a political issue here, to what can be best described as some uh, turf wars amongst the constituent local authorities. I'm not going to name names here, but uh, I've seen examples of, um, uh, I suppose, uh, activities, uh, demarcation disputes, let's call it that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm. Um, and there's some good points coming in here, actually, about collabor collaborative working between teachers and teachers mm. trying to work together to support the to support curriculum development. An interesting discussion here as well around um, the use, sort of subject specialist teachers, but some nice examples coming in in terms of physical education. And I think it was F Falkirk where the, 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 the physical education teachers can teach across um, the primary and secondary um, and with the music as well. But then other arguments coming in around concerns that that then becomes about in the primary about teaching a, a, a subject area again. Um, and those concerns around how the curriculum is perceived as subjects yeah. other than... I think there's, there's, there's a good distinction to make here which addresses that argument and that's the distinction between subjects and knowledge. You know, yeah. subjects are not the only way to address knowledge or you can have different configurations of subjects. So um, if, we, if we're not necessarily talking about teaching separate physics, biology and chemistry, for example, in primary schools, but what you can have is a more rigorous approach to teaching science across the curriculum. Uh, and it's about the scientific knowledge that is acquired, developed through that process, rather than the, the, the idea that we, we have to do it through the traditional subjects. Uh, and again, Deng in his book, and I would really recommend Deng's new book. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put the bibliography up here actually, um, but it's this book, um, uh, Knowledge Content Curriculum Didactic. Uh, it's a very expensive hardback and it's not very long. It's about 95 pages, which works out at a pound a page, but it's available much cheaper as an e-book. Um, but he, he makes a strong argument, and he's done it in his other work as well, that content is, uh, he talks about a the theory of content for education. So uh, he, he distinguishes between the knowledge that's framed in the disciplines and the content that's selected in school subjects. And I think that's an apt, uh, um, distinction there. Um, it, the, the question is not what subjects we should be teaching, the question is what knowledge do we engage young people with and how do we select content and how do we organise that content in schools in order to do that. And the argument may be that actually traditional subjects are good at doing that but there are significant gaps as well uh, in the curriculum. So where for example in the secondary curriculum do young people learn about sociology, politics and economics is, is a question I might pose. Definitely, and I think that's coming through in the chat as well, you know, saying that it's not, it doesn't even reflect life that we're going to say, well, I'll do this for ha math for half an hour and then I'm going to, everything comes together. And an interesting point that came up earlier and come, coming back again is talking about that aspect around how do we make the curriculum engage on with equality and diversity issues, but not so that it's, I'm teaching about this at this point, but it's embedded within it. Mm. Um, is, was there any examples of that within the curriculums, within the curriculum, within the, the examples within the book? Case In terms of decolonising the curriculum? Yes, and thinking about, yeah, engaging with equality and diversity issues and decolonising the curriculum. We didn't look explicitly at that because what we were looking at was curriculum making practices. Um, but I mean, there are certainly examples around Europe of, of culturally diverse curriculum practices. Um, and, and I think that uh, to some extent, we're doing that in Scotland now, um, but there's probably much more needed to be done uh, to have a, a culturally sensitive curriculum. Um, but that, given the, um, I mean, CFE provides principles, it doesn't provide content. So those decisions are really curriculum making decisions for schools and they have to be justified in the local context. And just a, a salutary warning from um, a paper we just published in the Curriculum Journal, where um, schools in Ontario, in Canada, which have a a very much a sort of social efficiency and perhaps slightly humanist orientations to the curriculum are running into problems in areas where there are large numbers of migrant parents from Eastern Europe 
who have a very much an academic rational tradition to the curriculum. So anything that you do in terms of engaging people differently, whether it be pedagogically, whether it be in terms of content or orientation, really has to be done in hand in hand with the local communities. And, and I would point people to David Leet's work around community curriculum making. But it's not just a case of getting the community on site through good communication, but actually looking at where the community provides resources and, and actually active curriculum making resources and where the community can con contribute to making the school curriculum rich. And that's actually a question that came up earlier around the involvement of the community within this. And I think just pulling the, our discussion to a close, I think it also raises the point that you said about the complex nature of curriculum um, and the examples that you gave of the different layers um, involved in curriculum making. Um, so yeah, that was that. That's really clear coming through. So I am conscious of time. Um, it's been really a pleasure to have you um, speaking today, um, and to um, the questions and the discussion that we've had has been excellent. And I'm going to try and save the chat so I have that, and we'll make sure that we get the video up onto um, our YouTube channel. So thank you to everybody who participated today. Um, in the session and a big thank you to you Mark for coming along and presenting. I, I know I've found it really interesting and the notes, <laughs> I was taking lots of notes and looking forward to looking at the book um, that you had. Um, to let you know that we've got two further events coming up in July, we have um, In Conversation with Walter Humes on the 23rd of July and the link for that will go live um, as of uh, as of tomorrow um, and we've got information about that on our website um, and the next event after that is the 30th of July with the Early Years Network having an event actually talking about transitions which links into what you were saying talking about today Mark and looking at transitions not just from an early years perspective but from across schooling and so I think that'll be interesting as well um, and the information about that is also on the website. So thank you very much, Mark, today, and thank you to everybody else. And um, I look forward to seeing you at Sierra Connects events in the future. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.